Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Kaleidoscope webinar all about uh, the future. So wherever you are in the present, uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Richard Taunt. I'm Nick Black. And I'm Alison Seeger. Uh, and uh, Nick, you've, unders you've undersold yourself. You've got at least a dozen letters after your name, have you not? Do you not want to give your, your full regalia, Professor uh, Sir Nick? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Professor of Health Services Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I've been for about 35 years. Uh, recently uh, joined Kaleidoscope as a senior associate, I'm delighted to, to, to say, and most of my career has been on looking at ways of uh, assessing and improving the quality of healthcare, predominantly the NHS in England, but many of the issues are universal. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and so over the next 58 minutes or so, uh, we're going to be hearing from Nick, uh, but we're also going to be having uh, a decent enough time for questions, discussion, uh, debate. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon, or if you're watching uh, on repeat, uh, thank you for thank you for tuning in. Uh, so a range of ways uh, you can get involved today. Uh, Alison, how can people get involved? So if you want to join in the discussion, please use the ask the question feature in your chat box and we'll respond to the questions when we can. Uh, you can also email us at hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or join us on Twitter. The hashtag we're using today is creative future. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, and just so again, we are recording today. So if your IT decides to take the afternoon off halfway through, uh, do not fear. Uh, we'll be back, uh, we'll be recording so you can watch it back at a later point. Uh, if you're joining, wondering what on earth uh, Kaleidoscope is, uh, Kaleidoscope, we're a social enterprise uh, focused on bringing people together um, to improve health and care. Uh, and part of what we uh, sort of set ourselves up to do was to try and have the sort of conversation which we thought needed to be had, uh, but often didn't. So particularly we do look for areas of sort of overlap and connection between different spheres, whether that's about practice and policy or policy and research and see how we can bring some of these different strands together, which is why we're delighted Nick, that you are joining us today, but also joining us as a senior associate here at Clydescope, um, particularly to help us think about some of these uh, many tangled threads which cross over healthcare uh, and how we can bring those together in new and innovative ways. So Nick, thank you. Please do uh, put in your questions, comments as we go through uh, and we'll come to those in due course. But I think, Nick, um, it's over to you. Thank you very much. So what we're going to be talking about today is a whole new way that we need to approach healthcare to be much more creative in the future. Let's start with where we are. And the first thing I want to make absolutely clear, and I hope you share that, is that the 70 years of the NHS, which are being celebrated this year, the NHS in England and the other parts of the UK that I'm going to focus on England, has made a major contribution to the dramatic improvements we've seen in the health of the population. And yet, and yet, we are still beset with some really daunting problems. These are problems you'll probably be familiar with, and I could have put all manner up on here, but here's the six which I think encompass the principal ones. We have huge complexity in the administration and regulation, such that even people working within the system, let alone patients and the public, really struggle to understand how it all fits together. The care is still not sufficiently patient-centered. It's still too oriented towards the interests and needs of providers. We've still got a continued dominance of the acute hospitals um, with year on year, despite the best intentions, consuming increasing proportions of the resources available. We've got variable productivity across those hospitals and across primary care. We know that the quality of care isn't as good as it could be, uh, even allowing for some of the shortcomings of the ways we measure quality. And perhaps arguably the most important of all, we have dispirited staff. So things aren't, we, we've had lots of success, but there's huge challenges. Now, you may share the view that many people do, 
that the answer is a lack of resources. The problems are lack of resources. The answer is more money. And these were just some headlines that came earlier in the year before the announcement by the uh, government to uh, provide some more, more funding for the NHS over the coming five years. But what's striking is that the call, the analysis that lack of money is the problem, goes across the political spectrum. It, whether it's trades unions or whether it's conservative uh, parliamentarians. This seems to be the universal response. Now, it may not be popular, but I'm going to suggest that actually that is not the answer. That it is certainly useful and will be helpful to have more money, but more money by itself will only provide short-term relief if it is simply spent on maintaining the status quo, by which I mean the way our hospitals, our primary care, our social care is currently organised. In five years' time, when any extra resources have been spent, we will still be having the sorts of headlines and the same sorts of problems that we face today. Now, why is this? Well, I think to, to get to the answer of how things should be different, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, we need to understand how we got here, because it's not because uh, people have either uh, been, uh, lacked insight and understanding, uh, or that, heaven knows, the bad people have done bad things. Not a bit of it. Everybody involved from policy making through to clinicians has been trying to do a good job. So it's not that it's not for lack of effort. I think I found one of the most useful ways to understand the last 70 years since the end of the Second World War, uh, not only in British healthcare, but it's, it's universal, but we're going to focus on, on England today. Uh, was put forward in a very elegant um, editorial by Arnold Relman, who was editor of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, for many years. And in 1988, he uh, wrote uh, what proved to be a seminal editorial. Now, in the, where he, he suggests a model, which I'll tell you about. But essentially, what we're trying to do in healthcare is provide an equitable healthcare system of satisfactory quality at a price we can afford. OK, it's as simple as that, but also that's the big challenge. And what he said was, well, what he identified back in 1988 was that the approach to improving health care had taken uh, two distinct forms up until 1988. The first was from 1950 to 1970, roughly, which he named the era of expansion, where the solution was, if you like, the magic bullet technical improvements, and it was an amazing 20 years. These are just some of the uh, fantastic uh, uh, advances in surgery, in drugs, in technologies that we're all benefiting from today and will continue to do. So a very productive period. And of course that led to provide all these things to a rapid growth in the number of hospitals, doctors, nurses, and biomedical research. Uh, this was, uh, at the same time raised public awareness and raised public expectations, whether it was in the sort of documentary type programs, Your Life in Their Hands, and similar programs in other countries, uh, or in the sort of soap operas, Dr. Kildare, Emergency Ward 10, and so on. Uh, so public expectations rose, demand rose, and of course, therefore, there was increased expenditure. Um, you can see here that over that, um, that period, uh, the 1950s and 1960s, uh, even in a system like the NHS, which was uh, the total cost is controlled by um, the government, of how much is spent each year, the expenditure on healthcare in England, well, this is UK, but similar for England, rose 50% each decade. Okay. And this was presenting um, a problem obviously, because this is public spending, but whatever form of spending it was. Um, and therefore, in around about 1970, what Relman recognised was there was a shift, not a replacement of technological advance that continued, but added to it a new paradigm, which he called the era of cost containment. Now, this was predominantly in the US rather than in the UK, because here we were able to control costs to some extent, 
by capping it. Um, and this is the area where you get things like uh, prospective payment, managed care, um, uh, a belief in market forces and competition would contain costs, uh, introduction of co-payments and so on. With what effect? Well, in this country, some effect, could, uh, costs did drop a bit, but they still rose at 40% a decade during the uh, 70s and the 80s. Why wasn't cost containment working? Well, around 1990, 88, 90, uh, it was recognized there were two forces that had not been taken into account in the uh, attempt to contain costs. One was the medical industrial complex, which in fact Relman wrote another editorial about in 1980. Uh, in fact, he was not the originator of the term. It came from uh, Barbara and John Ehrenreich. Uh, who wrote about it way back in 1969. And essentially what we're talking about here is that there are forces who have an interest in inflating and increasing expenditure. Industrial forces such as big pharma, um, hospital corporations, and so on, and, and the medical profession itself. So now, again, all well-meaning, and those bodies would all say that they are improving the health of the public, and that, that's, that's all good things are being done, but uh, that's one reason why cost containment wasn't working. You had an active, very powerful forces at work. The other was in around about 1980, the, or through the 70s and by 80, awareness that there were actually large variations in what was provided, what was done in each hospital. Um, this was the work um, here I show you are from Jack Wenberg and Alan Gittleson back in 1973 and lots of papers following that. And this just shows one example, each, each of these dots is a hospital with its territory, its district if you like. And as you can see, as you go from the left side of the graph with very little variation in the amount of use of something like an inguinal hernia repair, hysterectomy, removal of the womb, threefold variation between different districts, tonsillectomy, 12-fold, and so on. And at the same, and then also that sort of work was, uh, so, so you might have thought, oh, well, that's because the US healthcare system, there's competition, there's private forces, it wouldn't happen in a tax-based public system. No, exactly the same amount of variation was found between districts in England, by Kim McPherson and others through the 1990s. So this is to do with the nature of healthcare, not to do with the way healthcare is funded. So this was the other big reason why you had a problem of cost containment. Now the realization acceptance um, of trying to achieve equitable healthcare, satisfactory quality, price we can afford, therefore required two things. And this is what Relman was talking about in 1980. We need to be able to assess the benefits and costs of care, so assessment, to know what should be done, what was worth paying for, and we need to make professionals more accountable. We have to curb their autonomy to some extent. And therefore, what he was saying in uh, back, back then, 1988, was we now, as he to quote from his editorial, we now appear to be entering a new era. This was the third era, the third revolution, as he called it, the era of assessment and accountability. It's the third and latest. What did that mean? Well, what it meant was uh, the birth and the uh, embedding of things like evidence-based medicine, where you're looking at scientific evidence of the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness, guidelines, audit, re regulation, financial incentives, public disclosure all the things that have dominated the last 20 years um, in healthcare. Okay, well, they've had some successes. Um, here's just quickly show you three examples. This is the adherence by um, uh, the proportion of people who've had a particular type of heart attack who would benefit from angioplasty within 90 minutes. And as you can see over that, um, six year period, the proportion receiving what is defined and shown scientifically to be the best care, the sort of care that you and I would want, did indeed rise. So assessment was and accountability was working. Proportion of children with diabetes receiving all the recommended investigations, again, 
was, was, was rising over this period. And it wasn't just those sort of process measures, but outcomes were improving. And this shows in England the, the improved survival or the fall in mortality uh, for, pay, for adults in intensive care. And a dramatic improvement in a six year period of 20% improvement in survival. Huge, hugely beneficial. Um, so the era of assessment and accountability uh, was very successful in many ways, and yet the problems persist today. Why is that? Because if we can answer, if we can understand why, then we can start to think, where should we go from here? And it clearly isn't just more of the same because the problems are still there. The era of assessment and accountability was largely based on what are called the market-oriented tools. They came from manufacturing industry in the early 20th century, 100, over 100 years ago. And what they did, and were very effective in, those, in, the, in that sector, was to break production down into its constituent parts. You could measure each part. You then seek to control the variation. You standardize and you have centrally driven solutions. You provide incentives, you provide targets, you provide sanctions. That is, those are the tools of that sort of market-oriented approach. And as I say, it had some success in addressing the amount of paternalism and professional autonomy uh, that was of great concern around uh, 1980, 1990. But it also had so unintended consequences, and five in particular. Um, what's happened is that regulation has become far too burdensome on providers. We've created a low trust system where managers, clinicians, and others have a low trust in their superiors, higher up the hierarchy, not necessarily superior in any other regard. Um, combined with staff initiative is discouraged because if you're trying to standardize and put everything into the same way, you stifle innovation. It's perpetuated organizational silos, particularly by methods of funding. So everybody's looking out for themselves and their organization, whether it's a primary care center, whether it's a hospital, whether it's community nursing, whatever. And there's been insufficient rebalancing towards patients and shifting that balance towards co-production and uh, empowering patients. <coughs> so what I'm arguing is that we now need to moderate that. We don't get rid of assessment and accountability because it's done some good things. But just as we had to moderate the earlier era of expansion, uh, cost containment, we also now need to moderate assessment and accountability. And what was interesting is that when you look back at Relvin in 1988, when he announced we're on the dawn of the era of assessment accountability, he said it is the third and latest era, but probably not the last phase of our efforts to achieve. So he, even whilst advocating assessment and accountability, recognized that it probably wasn't the last one. Um, and so what I would suggest is that we are now enter, entering or have probably already entered a whole new era, which adds on to the other ones. They continue, and I'm calling it the era of systems and creativity, the fourth era. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a new paradigm. Um, and the key thing is it starts to enable health and care services to adapt to the inevitable complexity, uncertainty, and non-linearity of these topics, these activities. And that the two aspects, systems on the one hand, creativity on the other, are intricately linked. I think they were nicely put, uh, summarized by uh, Ian Burbage at the RSA last year in an article, think like a system, act like an entrepreneur. Now it may, you may be thinking, well, hang on a minute. Surely these are incompatible, even in opposition. A system which has clearly is some sort of overarching controlling thing. And yet you're saying, but also entrepreneurship, which is creativity, is innovation. Um, well, let me suggest why, in fact, that's not the case and that they are absolutely dependent on each other. We start thinking about systems. 
systems thinking is not new in the NHS. It's been around for years. It's just been the wrong type of systems thinking. It's been what I've called here organizational systems, which is top down and focuses on the parts, the hospital, the commissioning group, the primary care, social care. And what it does is it breaks these complex issues of providing care into actionable parts, because that's how it has, how it can cope. Um, the, and the aim has, of systems, that this systems, organizational systems, is to try and make each part of the organization, each organization within, function better. Okay? Not change anything, just function better. A consequence of that is that all those organizations take and feel responsible for the entirety. So if a patient, say with diabetes in a population, the hospital diabetes department feels responsible for patients with diabetes, but even though it's only seeing a small number of those who come into the hospital sector. And then when things don't go well, um, failure is blamed on the organizations and sometimes on the individuals. And not sometimes in the case of, of, of managers, they'll lose their job. That's the system we've created. What I'm talking about is that this, the, this approach is not grasp that health and social care are human systems. They're not like Ford trying to produce a car. What we have to do in a human system approach is to focus on the connections and the relationships and the shared meanings between the component parts. So we still have hospitals, we still have primary care centres, we don't just mulch them all together and mush them up, but we focus much more on those relationships between them. And then we make use of the resourcefulness and the perspectives of the people working in the system, in the organisations. And in that way, we can start to make the whole system responsive to the needs of patients and clients, because they're also players in shaping the future. And also the needs of staff, because the one thing we do know is happy staff makes for better, better care and better outcomes. So what we need, instead of the organizational leaders, we need systems, systems leaders, leaders who can lead a system, who can build relationships, who don't feel that they have to come up with the answer, but that they all will listen carefully to what is going on and they will focus on those relationships and that they will accept and recognize that the problems cannot be solved by a single organization. I'll give you an example. A, a, hospital doc, a hospital chief executive who feels responsible for solving the problem, the fact that there are ambulances queuing up to get into his A&E department, has got it wrong. He can't solve it. The only way it can be solved is a systems approach with all the other component parts. And yet at the moment, what we have is chief executives, medical directors who feel completely responsible and they try to come up with an answer and they fail. And sometimes they say they might lose their job. They got it completely wrong. This is unfair on those people. Now, what we need to do within this systems approach is this allows creativity to emerge. Now, the way we do creativity is not the formal management process. So on the formal, take the example I just gave you of uh, ambulances outside a and &E. The traditional formal approach is to say, right, we will get the chief exec of the ambulances, the chief exec of the hospital, maybe the director of the a and &E department, uh, a representative of the GPs and so on, round a table and we'll come up with a policy and a plan and put it out there. Mm -mm. Those people, however brilliant they are, won't actually know the people I would get together would be nurses working in A&E, in a &E, some ambulance and paramedics, some practice nurses, some community nurses, some social workers, people who are working with many of the people, patients lying in these ambulances. And you give them the space to have the right conversations. And it is a conversation. It is not giving them a task to come up with draw up guidelines. 
how long somebody will stay in an ambulance, what you do that. Let them explore and converse and find solutions. And they will come up with creative solutions. I guarantee it. They know best. They know why these things are happening and they also know what needs to happen. So it's really important. The solutions you get in any system depend almost entirely on who is in the room, who is included, and how the space is managed. What you need to do is get the people most intimately involved and then give them the space and the freedom, the time to have that discussion. There's no agenda for this meeting. You just get people in a room and you help support them have those discussions. Uh, and so what the system needs is we need to release the social entrepreneurship that exists within our, our wonderful NHS and social care staff. It's an holistic form of entrepreneurship. Don't be confused with the, um, the, with, with, the, with the sort of commercial entrepreneurship where people are motivated for making money and a profit. These are the people, social entrepreneurs are motivated by wanting to make the system work better for the patients, the public, and the staff. So, and they and the key, their key role in the system is creative disruption. And at the moment, anybody in the system who is a creative disruptor is actually discouraged because they're seen as a troublemaker. Again, we've got it completely the wrong way around. They are the people who will solve the problems for us. They will come up with brand new ideas if only we let them. And at the moment, we've got this low trust system that um, uh, does not encourage innovation. So we have to, that's the challenge. Now, you might feel, well, that's all very well. It's easy for him to say that, he's academic. He's just sort of, this is all sound. Well, you, know, you might buy him, this all sounds fine, but it's fanciful. It isn't fanciful because it's already happening. The era of, a set of, of systems and creativity, we're not waiting for it to start. It started. Just like Weldman was talking about assessment and accountability, because it had already started. Um, this isn't a, 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 a vision of the future that doesn't exist yet. I'll give you some examples. I'd say that the five year forward view and some of the initiatives from some of the uh, sustainability um, and transformation partnerships already essentially, that's what they're talking about. The transformation they are envisaging is one that focuses on as human systems and creativity. So to some extent, the encouragement from the center is there. Not sufficient yet, but it's there. And you can see wonderful examples um, around the country. Here's one example in um, South London, uh, where there was concern about the uh, failings of the mental health services, Dennis O'Rourke, an assistant director for commissioning uh, in, in, in the CCG, uh, developed, uh, led the development of a living well network, as you can see all the different groups who are represented on that, including patients and their carers. Uh, it now supports 400 people a month in the community with mental health problems. It led to a 43% reduction in referrals to traditional psychiatric care in the hospitals, a, a sector that was, was, was crying out for help um, because uh, and wanting more resources. You could actually, uh, you can reduce emergency admissions to hospital. This is uh, Compassionate Prune uh, in, um, down in Somerset uh, and the local GP, Helen Kingston with Jenny Hartnell, health trainer. Uh, they, their practice looks after 28,000 patients living in Room, small market town. Uh, and what they rec recognized was that a lot of the people who were getting admitted to hospital, the fundamental issue was that they were lonely and they were using the general practice and using the services, medical and health services, and actually that wasn't their primary problem. Anyway, they introduced all sorts of things, including talking cafes in the, in the uh, high street, they led, led to a 17% reduction in emergency admissions. As simple as that, but the simple things that done by those, the community hospital, the general practice, social services, and local voluntary organizations. Uh, in East Midlands, the paramedics got together with social workers and with general practice, 
Um, and they halved the number of elderly people who had falls in their homes who they were taking to A&E. Immediately, you've done something to help that queue of ambulances at the A&E department. Aside from anything else, the last thing we really want to do with an elderly person with multimorbidity who's had a fall is put them in hospital. There's a very high probability they'll, they'll develop delirium and other problems and may never actually then get them home again. So it is really irresponsible of the system where the system is actually perhaps causing harm rather than help. Um, Acute kidney injury within the hospital. This was some work done up in um, northwest of England. Uh, the nephrologist introduced uh, an acute kidney injury nurse. Acute kidney injury is just a very common but serious uh, complication that uh, arises all too commonly in hospital patients. Suzanne Wilson, the AKI nurse, was appointed. Nothing that clever. She went round educating ward staff about the signs of AKI to spot it earlier. They raised awareness with what result? That simple intervention and working together across the, the hospital, 28% reduction in incidence, 57% reduction in mortality from AKI. And the humanity of care can be improved. Here's um, Leslie Eldridge, a nurse, and Joanne Thorne, who was a healthcare assistant. Interestingly, she had a background as a fashion graduate. And like so many others, she was alarmed, uh, as were many staff for many, for many years had been about hospital gowns open at the back and the uh, demeaning effect that had and damage to patients, the humanity of their care. So what did she do? Well, on the kitchen table at home, she designed a hospital gown with poppers that makes it really easy for doctors to examine the patient without um, undressing them completely, um, maintain the dignity of patients, they went into production uh, no more expensive than traditional gowns. Uh, and there's lots of stuff from other countries, which isn't time to talk about today, but they'll be worthy of whole webinars at another time from others. Burtzorg, the self-directed district nursing teams in Netherlands, being tested out in parts of England now with dramatic effect, not least on a, being able to recruit and retain district <coughs> nurses in the team which is one of the biggest problems we face. Uh, it does the social entrepreneur, the creative disruptor does not have to be a member of staff. In Sweden, the introduction of shared dialysis and, co and where the patients take over and do a lot of the management of their own dialysis when they go into the dialysis unit, that was instigated by a young patient who simply said, why can't I do that for myself? Shock horror, the first reaction, but actually, yeah, why not? And they offered all patients, and now about 50% had taken up the option of doing it themselves. And from the healthcare system point of view, you actually then reduce the number of staff you need. So there are cost savings as well as benefits to patients. You much prefer to have some control and more patient-centered care. Again, that's being tested out in, 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 and introduced in, in England. Um, and Parkinson net self-management of Parkinson's disease in Netherlands. There isn't time to go into that now. So to finish, what I'm arguing is that the pressures on our health and social care services mean that just trying to do what we're already doing better is not going to be sufficient. It's not an option. <coughs> The status quo is not sustainable. So we've got to make some changes. Um, and what I suggest is what we need to change to uh, is to change our way of thinking about how services are run uh, through a system, a human systems approach, uh, releasing that creativity. It is going to be challenging, uh, but then Relman recognized that back in 1988 with the era of assessment and accountability. He wrote at the time, he said, no one should underestimate the size or difficulty of the task. However, the logical necessity of this new initiative seems clear. I would just echo Relman today. Same is going to be true for systems. You could say exactly the same for what I'm suggesting for the new era of systems and creativity. But it's an exciting challenge. And it's one that I think once people engage in it, will actually enjoy. Thanks. Nick.
Thank you very much indeed. It doesn't really work to do a round of applause on a webinar, but I think, <laughs> I think we can still do that. Thank you. Uh, Nick, a uh, tour de force. Um, I don't know if there's a record for how much uh, insight you can cram into 30 minutes, but I think you might just have set a new, uh, a new benchmark. Um, Nick, thank you. Uh, Alison, how can people join in? Um, if, you're, if you'd like to join the conversation, you can use the ask question feature in the chat box. You can email us via Hello Kaleidoscope. Uh, sorry, via hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or tweet kaleidoscope using the hashtag creative future. Awesome, thank We're you. taking questions now, so start. Questions, comments, reflections, uh, all very welcome. Um, and I might, if it's okay, I see questions are already starting to come in, uh, but I'm going to steal chair's prerogative for one moment just to uh, um, start the conversation. So, uh, Nick, you talk a lot about. Uh, Creativity. I think people could say, yeah, creativity. Well, I'll, I'll buy that. That sounds that sounds great. Uh, and using the ingenuity of stars, and I think we're going, yeah, that, that, that's great. But I think for me, the radical edge of this is that it requires us stopping thinking that the answers sit in this magic box at the centre, which mm. the Secretary of State might come up with, or one of our esteemed national bodies might come up with. And it's an interesting time with the, the 10 year plan on the horizon mm -hmm. and lots of people to caricature might be thinking, oh, great, a plan that's going to tell me what to do. Whereas actually your 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 uh, message is the, the, the answers don't sit there. The answers sit with staff. That to me seems quite a challenge to a top down hierarchical mm -hmm. bureaucracy such as yeah. such as the NHS. And although you say that some of these issues are about healthcare, not just about the UK, do you fear that, I want you to lead a question, but do you fear that the way the NHS is set up doesn't necessarily help with this transition? Or are you, are you slightly more hopeful than that? I have to start by saying I'm an optimist, so therefore, Good. Excellent. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I recognise absolutely the challenges of, of where what's got to be overcome. Uh, I don't honestly think what the, the vision I have of how healthcare should be can be achieved without the centre getting on board um, uh, and in a sense accepting that they don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, there is still this tendency as the 10 year plan in its very nature um, I mean, obviously we haven't seen it yet. I've not been involved in any of it. But I'm sure it's going to be brilliant, by the way. Uh, um, you know, my, my heart sort of sinks at the 10 year plan because, you know, I've been in, in this area for nearly 40 years and that I, I've lost count, as you probably have, of the number of plans that we have had in the NHS. And it is symptomatic of that central approach that those at the centre somehow know better than those who are delivering. And not only is this just not true, there are lots of brilliant people at the centre, but there are also lots of brilliant people in the periphery. Don't they? Um, but all the evidence shows that that, it, that does not work. Um, the other thing, part of that centralisation is the notion that uh, everybody must do things the same way. Now, this is where it does get a lot of kickback and rejection and, and, op and opposition from the center because reasonably enough people say, well, what you're advocating, there's going to be a lot more variation between places mm -hmm. if you're gonna let everybody. Well, I think it's a mixture. I think the role of the center, let's take the positive side. The role of the center is to um, establish the policies, the broad brush policies of things like the amount of equity that should be provided, the, the effect. There is still a need for NICE to provide clinical guidance on what works better than something else. That's still, we, we need all that. We're not throwing all that out and just letting everybody do whatever they, they feel like doing. That would be disastrous. But we must curb the tendency of the center is a sort of mission creep. The need to, um, try and, and decide what should happen. We should, and we, there's got to be a greater tolerance at the center for variation. Now that is really difficult 
because then what you get thrown back at you is it's a national health service. Mm. It's not as well, it is and it isn't. It's actually a whole series of local health services. And in some ways, I think the introduction of um, STPs, integrated care systems, may well help because then we start to see that there are these um, more autonomous groupings on a regional basis. And we should let each of them have the freedom to do things their own way. But what we should absolutely do is continue to assess them all. So we've got to make sure that the outcomes, the mortality rates, the patient reported outcomes are equally good everywhere. But we shouldn't try and tell people how to achieve those. We, we should give them advice. We should say you might want to go look at this place and that place and so on and see different ways of doing it. But we've got to be tolerant of a certain amount of variation in process and in input. Not tolerant of variation in outcomes. We, we have to, mm. and the Secretary of State is, is responsible to ensure that whether you live in Rochdale or whether you live in Guildford, you have the same sorts of access to good care with the same sorts of outcomes. But what that care looks like doesn't have to be the same. Nick, thank you. I, I, we'd, we'd love perspectives uh, for those of you joining, whether you're joining live or, or afterwards, about uh, whether you share Nick's optimism uh, that this is a this is a major challenge mm. uh, facing the mindset of, of those. And it's so interesting just to our language that we do talk about the centre, mm. which just implies that sort of this is this is where things really happen. And, and that they know better. Yes. Um, don't necessarily. Sometimes no. it might. Um, uh, thank you for those already starting to send through uh, questions. A uh, question from uh, David. David, thanks so much for joining. Uh, saying creating the, the space, the time, and environment for patient facing staff to engage in creating solutions is key. However, in my experience, challenges during this include A, find the time for staff to engage in this way amongst other priorities and demands, and B, navigating the process to take their ideas forward to organisations and across organisational boundaries. Um, it doesn't really work to sort of see everyone nodding on a webinar, but I'm sure, David, there are lots of people nodding to exactly your points. Uh, so a, a question from David to you, Nick, saying, to what might help encourage us? These are yeah. sort of pretty meaty challenges. Yeah, no, I recognise, David, exactly that. and and and. You know, generally speaking, all health and social care staff are overworked. Um, and that will continue until we have the courage to actually allow, give people the space and time to look at how to transform things. And that might mean, again, not politically terribly popular, that say something concrete like a waiting list might get longer. For instance, if you were to say to an orthopedic uh, department. Uh, well, yes, you do need the time. And what we're going to suggest is over the next six months, half a day a week, you basically shut up shop and you don't do any operating and all the staff are involved. Uh, and that's from the porters, the operating theatre staff, the ward staff, the consultants, the leases, everybody is going to spend time talking and working out ways they could do things better. The benefits will come because you'll actually catch up later because you're going to be working in much more productive ways. But that takes a lot of courage by the management and you can't do it. Staff cannot do it unless they've got the sort of air cover from senior management to say it's OK. And that also they need air cover from the centre to say we are um, removing the targets or we are um, making the targets much looser to allow you to have that time and space. Uh, and all these, I recognise, you know, people <coughs> say that's all fanciful, it'll never happen. But we've got to be, have that discussion and involve the public as well, be it the Health and Wellbeing Board, be it uh, Health Watch, to say the way we will get to the new sunny uplands is actually, we're going to have to go into a bit of a trough and actually reduce. The other thing I would say is that we have an opportunity now with the 20 billion uh, on the table that is going to come through over the next few years, I would advocate that that should be ring fenced entirely for transformation. Now in the past that hasn't happened. Better care fund, what happens is that the usually the acute hospitals say, 
we are we are bankrupt, we are overspent, uh, and we need bailing out. The trouble is, we keep doing that. In five years' time, we're going to be in exactly the same position. And at that point, there will be people who will advocate that the system itself, the NHS, is not sustainable, is not viable, and we need to look at a whole different way of providing healthcare. I suspect most people listening to this would not welcome that. I certainly wouldn't. So therefore, we have to put our house in order before critics start saying it's impossible to turn it round. I think it is possible to turn it round, but we've got to start now. So if anyone was doubting the radical edge of this conversation, uh, are we prepared for waiting lists to get longer for uh, so short term, short term pain for long term gain? Uh, are we willing to invest that extra money solely on transformation? Mm -hmm. um, I think if everyone is of the same mind on this on this call, I think probably we've gone wrong somewhere. So these are these are these are not easy issues, um, and just the I, I think what I hear loud and clear Nick, is that we've, we've got to seriously grapple with those trade-offs rather than thinking that there is some, some magic way where we can both have everything now and everything later and keep everyone happy. We've got to get real as to the nature of the challenge. Yeah, and, and um, going back to David's comment, staff cannot be expected to do that unless they are given the resources and time to do it. And that's where the 20 billion comes in because that could provide some alternative shoring up, backfilling to allow that space. Not that you can suddenly create more orthopedic surgeons overnight, say, but there would be some activities where, where you could actually backfill with other, while well, we sort of double run services and things like that. My fear is that the money will disappear into uh, propping up the status quo. Uh, so we'd love uh, reflections, uh, comments, questions, um, three ways to do that, as you can see on your screen. Uh, Alison, I know you've got a question coming to you in one second, just to say, Heather, thanks very much for joining, uh, echoing David's point about how you actually give frontline staff the time to share these creative ideas and just how you create this within the current structure. Um, Alison, have you got the solution? Because I think we have <laughs> No, my question was along the same lines. I think what you're proposing is an enormous paradigm shift in mm. institutional change. How do you catalyze that? Mm. And similar to que uh, Heather's question, if you're now training leaders to work to facilitate relationships and connections, when and how do you train those leaders mm. to, to do this? Yes. No, you're absolutely right. It is yeah, a different... At what level? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the traditional training of our managers is still largely on the sort of MBA type approach, mm -hmm. which is training people to run organizations. And so we actually got to change the training. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. That's the first thing. You know, this, as any paradigm shift, you know, this is going to be 10, 20 years, but we've got to get started. Um, so you're absolutely right. We've got to, we've got to train people in systems leadership. It's a different training. Now, some of our existing managers will absolutely go for it and say, this is what I've been wanting to do for years. Some won't, and they'll move on and retire and so on in time. But, um, uh, but, but yes, we, we, we've got to change the training of managers. Uh, we've also got to change the training of clinical staff so that they, I mean, the bizarre, one of the problems is that, is that doctors, nurses, and others I say this as a doctor, we are trained to come up with answers and solutions mm -hmm. very rapidly. If you're working a doctor in A&E, you know, you've got one minute, two minutes to make a diagnosis and decide on the clinical management. And as a patient, that's what I want. I want decisiveness. Ideally, it's the right decision. But, uh, and I quite like to participate in it if there's a choice. Um, so that mindset is very different from a mindset that says, I don't really know. It's all a bit uncertain. Mm. We need to talk about this and explore. And it's a very different sort of person. So there is a big challenge, particularly for the clinicians, not just the managers, to start thinking. And we need to start training our clinicians to be able to think more flexibly and to think mm. about how to answer questions and rather than 
so almost like how to put questions, how to have conversations and not feel that they've just got to have the answer. And yet a medical training is quite the opposite. It does the opposite. It has it, the basis of medical training, something that nurse training is, is certainty, a certain answer. So it's hugely demanding, but it'll be very exciting. And I think at the end of it, I think it is doable, uh, but we will need to get people to think differently. Um, and that will take, as I say, um, at least 10 years. Um, again, we welcome questions, reflections on the, on the comments about uh, 10 years, too short, too long. Uh, how can this be catalyzed? Uh, and just to remind you once again, about how to get involved, those options there are on your screen. Um, we're, we're fast running out of time, so please do put in uh, questions and reflections if you if you have them uh, so we can reach them before we close. Uh, but a, a quick one for me, um, Nick, which is that there is something really exciting about how we can think about the whole range of talents we have employed both within the healthcare service but also in our wider health services mm -hmm. and how we can sort of unlock some of that ingenuity but also you make a really interesting point about a new relationship with patients mm -hmm. and clients mm -hmm. which isn't we are the healthcare service we have the answer but a more of a two-way conversation about well let's work together to create mm. solutions so that those that that centrality of that sort of professional patient conversation seems key in this new era i think it is and i, I think it fits in very much with whether you want to call patient-centered care co-production um because the some of the most radical innovations and the, you know, some of the best creative disruptors will be patients now traditionally of course they're seen by doctors nurses as a problem you know they are um, you know the, the patient nobody wants we've got now okay there are some difficult patients of course but some of them they are they will be the ones like the young man in sweden who said when i come here why is it that an expensive highly trained nurse goes to the cupboard, gets all this stuff, quickly plugs me into this and that. I'm actually fit and healthy. I just need dialysis. Mm. I could do all that. I know where it all is. I watch it. I could do all that. So, um, and of course, the other beauty of co-production uh, is that you get better outcomes. So it's a win-win. Mm. Uh, everybody benefits from it. So I think it's absolutely vital that in those discussions in each and every primary care center, social care department, hospital, patients are involved uh, because they will actually come up with answers. It won't, we don't, again, don't have to keep relying uh, just on professionals. Uh, they've got lots to contribute. I mean, if I'm looking at a outpatient clinic where people are having to wait excessive times beyond their appointments time the person i would talk to would be the receptionist uh, who would not only probably tell me yes i know it's dreadful because he or she is the one who gets the angry patient saying why am i still waiting not the doctor mm -hmm. once once the patient goes in to see the doctor late there'll be nicest pie to the doctor generally um, so they don't even know what's going on. The other beauty is that the receptionist will probably, if you actually then said to the receptionist, so what might we do differently? Probably said, oh, well, that's straightforward. We need to do this, this and this. Why aren't we? Oh, I've been saying that for years, but I've given up now. And that is a sort of classic situation that we've got in, in the health system. Um, so we don't have to be clever and come up with uh, doesn't need real clever professors to come up with answers as to how to run an, uh, an outpatient department better. The people running it will come up with it, as will the patients who are sitting there observing what's going on. And they'll say, well, I sat here, then I went there, then I went there. Why couldn't I have just done this? So the answers are out there. 
Excellent. Um, uh, Nick, thank you. We've got five minutes to go. Uh, we're going to do refl uh, reflections before we finish as well. Uh, just say comments, questions still coming through. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we should say a, a, a big hello to Manfred and I think the entirety of Imperial College Health Partners. Manfred, it better be the entirety. I'm imagining a football stadium now of you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining, watching on mass. Uh, question around catalyzing change as an AHSA academic health science network uh we play a role in this uh nick um i like the personalization of this how can you <laughs> nick so you raise the issue so you own it how can you better bring uh together organizations such as ours to catalyze this movement uh um nick i'll leave you to think about the answer to that uh, just for one second, say another comment, David, thank you very much for this one. Uh, say the STP initiatives seem to be a process aiming to encourage real collaborative working and systems thinking. However, while some have made good progress, others seem hindered by current fragmented NHS structures and the rules they need to follow. Arguably, the 10-year plan needs to help make systems work easier uh, as a strategy of the plan by removing some of these hindering perspectives and encouraging a different mindset. David, I'm sure there are lots of people uh, at Imperial College Health Partners and elsewhere <laughs> nodding along. Uh, so Nick, you've got uh, two minutes to apply to a fantastic question from Matthew. Yes. yes, well, I mean, the Academic Health Science Networks absolutely have a key part to play and, and yours and, and others around the country are already making uh, very effective and useful contributions. I wasn't quite clear from your question, how, how can you better bring together organisations such as ours? I wasn't clear whether that meant bringing together AHSMs or bringing together the organisations within your AHSM. If it, as AHSM, so Coalition of the Willing, how can they come together? Well, I understood that, the, you'll know more about this than me, but I understood that there was some sort of federation or network of AHSMs who could um, at least sort of compare notes and learn from one another, but I, I may be wrong on that, um, because I'm, I'm not an active part in an AHSM. Um, but uh, across the, the your region, across, across Northwest London and the Imperial College one, um, bringing together the organizations. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're already doing that. There aren't, again, the limitation is, I think, until we've actually got some changes at the center that facilitate this, it's always going to be quite limited what can go on locally, albeit at a regional level like an AHSN. So I think it is fairly fundamental that we've got to try and get some changes at the national level first um, I don't see the 10-year plan uh, being particularly helpful on this. Oh, um, no, where's your optimism gone? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm optimistic. I just don't see the 10-year I, I would caution people to expect the 10-year plan to come up with the, with, with the solutions, unless we're going to be very pleasantly surprised by, by what's in it, um, uh, which I hope is true. Nick, thank you. We have uh, two minutes to go. Uh, so with, before we close, I'm just going to come to my uh, fellow panellists just to have uh, one, one, one reflection from our discussion. Um, I will start just to buy time, so I'll start, and then Nick, then, then Alison. Uh, but just to say thanks again to everyone who's joined. Uh, we will, can we circulate slides, Nick? Yes. That's okay, excellent. Uh, do, uh, we will circulate those following this. Uh, just to say uh, lots more about creativity and connections uh, at the Kaleidoscope website, kaleidoscope.com healthcare please do have a look if you're not aware of what we do as i can see i'm stalling for time just to buy colleagues time uh so the single single reflection so for me i think what i'm really struck by uh nick is that this 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 era is already here we're not debating whether it's coming it's here it's about actually how we can catalyze it how we can accelerate it and what can be done to make it uh, the, the mainstream sooner rather than later. Nick? I think I'll just, on, the, on that line, make that point that despite the uh, inappropriate structures and pressures that exist, which we've talked about in the current system, despite that, brilliant things are going on locally below the radar. I showed you a few examples, there are many others all over the country. And that gives me great hope because if you can do it even with the existing sort of lack of support from the centre, imagine what we could do if we could 
change the attitudes and get that paradigm shift at the center, which I don't think is out of the question. It's tough, but I think collectively we have to work on that. Next, thank you. Alison. Um, what's really struck me is that it's inspiring that things are happening despite the major paradigm shift. And I think it's kind of a call to action for people to feel empowered and to take ownership of healthcare in the UK and probably the wider world. Um, so yeah, it's inspiring. <laughs> awesome. What a fantastic note to end on. We will finish there. It has hit time. Uh, we have been recording. We will share it back. Thank you all once again for joining. Nick, thank you for, again, thank a you. fantastic overview uh, and an inspiring note to end on. Uh, look forward to working with you in, a, in achieving this paradigm shift. Thanks again. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.